Well, it's uh, the first Sunday of the new year, right? Happy New Year, all that, you know? Good. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and here we are. Um, this, is, this is usually the Sunday where um, only the really faithful, committed people come. So this is the, the week that, uh, uh, you know, you don't usually invite family and friends to that first Sunday after New Year's. It's kind of quiet. And they've all gone home. And so this is the chance, traditionally, where... Uh, where I can actually uh, have a talk with you because nobody else is listening, right? So we can talk about, you know, what's, what's most important um, without having to uh, fluff it up for, uh, you know, all your families <laughs> and friends and neighbors. Okay, so uh, having said that, now you're wondering what he's going to do. <laughs> um, so uh, resolution, anybody do the New Year's resolution this year? Oh, what? Oh. Thank you, Jake. And uh, anybody? Else? Nobody else, huh? Okay, now we're good. Little one. Little one. Doable. A doable one. So one you've already accomplished. So okay. <laughs> you were gonna. You're, you're, you resolved that you were going to come to church on the first Sunday of the year. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, okay. So resolutions. I, I I went and looked in the Bible this week about. Uh, where that is is most illustrated, and I and I basically only found two places. One of them, ironically, is uh, in Daniel, first chapter of Daniel, and uh, uh, he and some friends were were captured and taken into captivity, and where they're put into kind of a military academy, sort of uh, for the king, and they were uh, told they'd have unlimited uh, fattening foods, and uh, and the bar would be open, the king's bar, so. Uh, all that they wanted. And so uh, it says here that, um, um, but Daniel resolved, made a resolution, he resolved to not defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission to eat some vegetables and drink water. Um, so that I think was the first time that someone had a New Year's resolution that they were going to go on a diet. That was the first thing. We're not going to eat a lot of you know red meat and fatty foods. And it's the first time in the in uh, the Bible I think that someone did a resolution to start recovery. And and you know I'm not going to I'm not going to drink. So okay. And so we, those are two really important ones. But that's not all. I go to the New Testament and uh, this is the one I want us to look at this um, Sunday. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, listen to this. Paul's writing to him. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I was resolved. Is that word? Resolved. Res resolution. I was resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not uh, with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on people's wisdom, but on God's power. That's what I want us to deal with today. So Lord, teach us from your word. Teach us how we might uh, grow and live in this new year and that we might gain a perspective that you would have for us. That's our need in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I was resolved to know nothing among you. Now, if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, the chapter just before it, it opens up and you find this church, it's all with issues and, and struggles and they've got divisions and they've got arguments and they've got theological things and they've got moral issues and they've got all these things going and they are waiting for uh, Paul to come in and straighten it all out. Which he could have done, I guess, you know, he could have come in and had a plan and helped them work through their issues and conflict management and all those kind of things. And instead he went, you know, I'm just going to know one thing, Jesus and him crucified. And that's, the, that's, that's all I know. And um, uh, 
And I thought, maybe I need a resolution. Maybe I need a resolve. Um, because, um, you know, I, I get, uh, because of the books, it's like I got this letter from somebody um, a while back, 17 pages handwritten, sent certified mail, so I had to go sign for it. And um, <coughs> lady pours out her, her story and her life, pictures of her children and all these things, and the ups and downs, the twists and turns, and all that. I get to one page, and, and, and then I shot my husband. You know, that's, a, that's an attention getter, you know. And, and so, you know, then when she was in prison, she lost her kids to her husband. He got custody, and now she wants them back. And after all, I didn't kill him. I just shot him. <laughs> and then the whole thing turns to, so, Dr. Westfall, what are you going to do for me? How are you going to help me? How are you going to get involved in this? And help me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even want to read this now. <laughs> but, you know, I could have pretended to be smart. Say, well, you know, this is easy. You know, here's what you do, blah, 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 blah you know, deal with this all the time, you know, and uh, never let them show, see a sweat. And, uh, but at some point you go, I don't know. We do, we, if Jesus isn't Lord, then then what are we going to do? You know. And I find this often as a pastor. If 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 Jesus doesn't show up, if if God's not present and the Holy Spirit is not working in His people, then a lot of our plans don't amount to much. They occupy our time, but they really don't amount to much. And what's really important is, are we creating a space? Are we creating enough room in our lives, in our church, in our, in our families, in our relationships, so that the Holy Spirit can work and Christ can be central in it? And we're free from having to be the fix-it folk, right? Um, part of this issue revolves around perspective. How do we get perspective? And um, I'm not an artist, so I don't understand perspective, but um, uh, Howard Hughes, uh, I watched that movie years ago about his life, and, and one of the part of it was he was filming this uh, movie uh, over LA with, with fighter planes. It was kind of a war movie, and the fighter planes were flying around really, really dangerously and, and fast, and they filmed it all, and he was so excited about this scene, and he went in to see the dailies and looked at it, and he said it looked like the planes were sitting still in the air. They just were there, suspended in the air. And he went, nobody can see how dangerous it is. Nobody can see how fast they're going. And, and, uh, and somebody said, well, that's because there's no perspective. You have to have something still for it to go by in order for you to know it was fast. And so they got weather reports and they moved the whole crew up to Oakland because Oakland had a cloudy day. And they filmed it all with the planes coming out of the clouds. And suddenly it seemed faster and more exciting because you had the, the perspective of the cloud. And now when the plane goes by, it's really fast. What do we have spiritually that's a perspective? What do we have that with all of our life where we're just, things are streaming around and going and spinning on us and circling and we're dealing with things and trying to keep afloat and celebrating and all of the things that we've got and plans and dreams and hopes and fears and all of these things, we've got it all going. How do we see it differently than just a bunch of stuff sitting out there? How do we? It requires perspective. And I think that, that what this passage is telling us, I resolved to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. That becomes the solid. That becomes the stationary thing on which our whole life, as it moves around, takes on meaning. But without that, it's just a lot of motion. It's a lot of stuff. And... Um, You know, I, I, I probably have told you that I, my theory in all this of why he did this going into Corinth was that uh, 
in the book of Acts, that just before he went to Corinth, he was in um, uh, teaching on Mars Hill, which ironically in our city right now, uh, he was uh, came to Mars Hill to preach. And he had the this, this sermon that um, I used to teach preaching at Fuller Seminary, and everybody thought this was the perfect example of a sermon. And it was that he would take things of popular culture, he quoted from a Greek philosopher and dropped some names and he kind of worked it all in. And I see you all are religious and spiritual and, and uh, the unknown God. He, he had this real fancy pants sermon uh, trying to relate, trying to relate and draw in from what he sees in the culture. And it was a big failure. It was a total failure. At the end of it, it says, people said, well, we can talk some more later. Oh, hum. And he, and he left that experience and said, no more playing for the culture, trying to figure out what's going on. No more trying to uh, be clever. I want to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. That's the perspective. And it changed for him. Now, why is it important? I want to know Christ and him crucified. Why isn't it enough to just say, I want to know Christ? Right? I want to know Christ. That seems worthy. And I thought about that this week. Isn't, isn't it enough to just say, I want to know Christ? Why do we have to get into the negative? Why do we, you know, the cross is kind of negative and uh, kind of violent. And uh, he was executed for my sins. That seems so ooh, not affirming. Um, isn't it enough that we just know Christ? Well, here's the issue. It's easy for us to, without perspective, to shape Christ and our view of Jesus into anything we want. We can, we can twist our view of him and we can make him so that he serves us. He's the kind of Jesus, just what we want him to be. I remember a few years ago in California, we had a youth pastor, Scott Pombush, who was a uh, big uh, Stanford football player before he went to seminary and became a pastor. He looked like The Rock. You know, The Rock? Not The Rock for me. The Rock, the actor. He looked just like him and uh, big and strong. And, uh, and I went to his office one day and he had on his desk this little collection of Jesuses. Uh, he had the buddy Jesus, which was kind of this cool hanging out Bro, <laughs> buddy Jesus stuff. Then, then he had the Jesus action figure in the original box. And, and then he had the Jesus bobblehead and, all along his desk. And, and, and I said, uh, Scott, where's the uh, Christ crucified? And without missing a beat, he goes, oh, those don't sell very well. The kids don't really like them. So what is it? Are we going to worship the buddy Jesus? The action figure, the bobblehead Jesus? This is what we saw in the Gospels when John the Baptist had, had preached and told everybody how Jesus was going to come and he was going to bring judgment and he was going to bring, uh, he was going to the, put the axe to the root of the tree and bring the whole thing down and then throw it on the fire and all you unfaithful people are going to burn up and that's what Jesus is going to do. And then when he's in prison, what does he do? He sends his people to Jesus and said, should we look for somebody else? Because you're not doing any of that. You're going around helping people and healing and loving people and forgiving. And you're not doing any of the things I said that you would do. Are you him? Or should we look for somebody else? Jesus wasn't living up to his expectations. And I got to admit, sometimes Jesus doesn't live up to our expectations. And we, we have certain ideas and certain things we want him to do and be and, and how we want him to fit into our life conveniently. And he doesn't do it and it, and it frustrates or irritates us and, or, or saddens us sometimes, honestly. 
that's why it's not enough to say, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ and him crucified. Now we have perspective. Him crucified. In time, in place, in history, violent death, uh, executed for my sins, for your sins, um, sacrificing himself for our forgiveness and our life. That Jesus. I want to know that Jesus. Who out of love gave everything so that we could live. I resolved to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And then he says that it's the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that helps us understand this. And that people don't understand. He said, you know, uh, foolishness of, of God is, is wiser than people's wisdom, but people think that they're smarter than God and it's the Holy Spirit who shows us what's going on and gives us a wisdom to understand. It's the Holy Spirit at work that to teach us and to show us how we might live out the implications of Christ and him crucified in our life. Maybe this is the year, you know, just as, a, as your pastor, just say it. Maybe this is the year that uh, that I need to focus on the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, teach us, show us more about uh, about God, and more about ourselves, and more about our world, and how we can live, and more about our community, and how we relate together. And Lord, uh, send Your Spirit here among us. Honestly, a lot of times as a pastor, you don't need the Holy Spirit because you've got a lot of planning to do. You got a lot of good people who can work hard. You don't need the Holy Spirit. I, I was a Presbyterian pastor for way too long, you know, my whole life. And, uh, you know, we never planned a single thing that we didn't have enough money, buildings, and people to accomplish. And as soon as we had the money, people, and buildings to accomplish it, the Lord led us on a new adventure. <laughs> Once it was guaranteed, we never stepped out where we could have failed. That wouldn't have been Presbyterian. <laughs> but, um, sorry, if any of you have those kind of leanings. Um, but what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, first of all, it, the Holy Spirit, this is telling us in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, the, the Holy Spirit is, is like a counter to the world's culture and the world's view and the world's perspective. He said the, the way the world thinks, uh, when they hear about Christ and him crucified, they are repelled by it and they think it's stupid. Uh, it's, it's foolishness. And, and yet, to those who are being changed and transformed by the Holy Spirit, it's, it's far wiser than, uh, than what the world has to offer. Now, have you noticed something going on culturally? I, maybe I'm just, you know, seeing this. Have you noticed that there's starting to be a lot of movies, biblical movies, without God? Uh, you know, first first we had Noah, you know, and you get Noah without God, <laughs> just kind of a God, wild guy, you know, killing people and beating up everybody and fighting off everybody and, you know, just kind of keep the Lord out of it. It was a great boat building adventure, you know, <laughs> like boat building. Um, and now the new one's coming out, Moses without God. That's going to be great. I wonder how, they, how are they going to do that burning bush thing where, God, where he's arguing with God about, I'm not doing this. I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't have to do this. You know, God's going, nah, I'm going to do it. You know, okay, you take God out of the thing, and I guess he's just talking to himself or the bush, you know. <laughs> but um, so, so Moses uh, takes the people out. Good thing that electric storm came out and parted the sea, you know, because otherwise it would have been embarrassing. But... Um, and then a book, a great book. In fact, I love the book. I, I read all this stuff. Malcolm Gladwell uh, 
you know, Tipping Point and, and some of those things. And, and so he has the book, uh, David and Goliath. Well, I thought this is great, you know, a nice biblical story. David and Goliath, it's a management book. The subtitle is Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Beating Giants, Battling Giants. So, have you read it? Well, I recommend it, it's a great book. It's a great book. David and Goliath, without the Lord. It's perfect. And it was David's shrewd plan and strategy and how he used his, his uh, weakness and he used the, uh, to surprise Goliath and counter Goliath's strength because he had this plan that, that, that he could concoct that knew how to use the weakness of the giant to bring him down. And that David was a genius. Although David said, it was all the Lord. I'm looking at them going, so our culture has found a way. They take these stories and they go, these are great stories. These are meaningful stories. These are inspiring stories. If we can just get God out of them, then they'll really be good. Then they'll be useful. Well, I'm trying to do just the opposite. I'm trying to take all the stories of our culture and our lives and our, what's going on in our world, and I want to stick God in it. Right in the middle of it. Take every secular story, every news clipping, every sports interview, everything, and say, how do we find the living God in the middle of this? Show what God's doing in this world. That's what I want to do this year. I want to ransack our culture for Jesus. And go, Lord, where are you? I want to look at I want to look at uh, look at the stories on Yahoo and uh, or as my dad said Yahoo <laughs> uh, he was older but um, uh, I want to look at those stories and go Lord what are you teaching us in this where's Christ and Him crucified in in this event and in that. And let's, uh, let's look at that and celebrate and say, whoa, here's where God's working and here's what we can learn from that. Here's what God wants to teach us in the middle of that. We're going to do the opposite of Hollywood and the opposite of Malcolm Gladwell. Let's take their stuff and claim it for Jesus. That's my resolution this year. I don't know how it'll turn out. But I want, I want this to be the year that I take my hands off my life and the people near me, <laughs> you know who you are, and, uh, and the church and all these things. I want to take my hands off it and say, Lord, help me see you at work. I want to have a ringside seat at the biggest spiritual circus around and go, Lord, it's all I know, Christ and him crucified.